So I thought that after I went over all the material in the cl that class, that I would start getting more posts. I'm still not getting posts. Um, so I, I'm not, people aren't coming to office hours. I'm not hearing from anybody. I have no idea what's going on for most of you. Um, so this is the plan moving forward. Um, so this is what I think, you know, has happened. And so I think a lot of you are going to have to spend way more time on the class than it's structured to do. So here's how we're going to proceed from now on. You must come prepared, okay? You must read it beforehand, okay? I will give you what I gave you seven pages of reading for today and I asked you to find your own article, right? So that's number one, no matter how far behind you are, you must read when you come to class, okay? Then I'll give you seven minutes at the beginning of the class and you can write, this is, you write your three reactions. If you've already written them, just call them to mind, write more, just write. And then all you have to do is put that in your post. You don't have to spend any extra time on your post. If you come to class prepared and you've already gotten stuff to write and I'll give you time to write, okay? No extra time. Okay, if your internet is down, whatever it is, you can't come to class, watch the video, read the material before you watch the video and write down your reactions so that all you have to do is post. You don't have to spend any extra time, okay? Then after I give you time, I'll call on each of you to describe one of your reactions, right? You should be able to do it because I've just given you the time to do it, right? Then each day from now on, um, actually, I think this is, is going to happen in general, but maybe not whatever it is, I'll ask you to find your own article, right? I did ask you that today. You find your own article. Again, you write down, this is, you've already done your post. When you take notes on that, that's your post. Come prepared to present, okay? Then as you listen to the other students, write down, that's your post right there. You're just doing it. Um, okay, so you'll be required to listen to at least three other presentations. So if, if the class starts to develop into lots of presentations, then I'll let you go. You don't have to listen to all of them. You just listen to some of them. So you can cut out half an hour, an hour from the class. So you have more time. Okay. You should already have almost entirely finished your post by now. Just by the end of the class, all you need is three or four sentences to describe the most important thing. This is the way I structured the class. So, okay. What's actually happened is students are so far behind, they're gonna basically have to take the class all over again. Same material, right? And they're gonna be spending eight hours per hour of class, It'll be three hours in class, three hours on the YouTube, two or three hours on the homework, eight or nine hours. And it was originally structured for four, four and a half hours. I don't know what to do about that. I just, I trusted you 
to pace yourself and well, for whatever reason that's not been done <laughs> but i can't like eliminate the first month of the class <laughs> so but from now on this is what i had in mind right and i all i'm doing is telling you step by step what i told you before come prepared it's just that I will give you time to write it down. And then I'll give you time to write down during the class, okay? Um, all right. I don't want you to attend the class. Go back and attend the class again via YouTube. That's incredible amount of time and you're not learning anything new. That was not what I intended for you to take the class twice. The reason for the YouTubes is because so many students can't, you know, their internet isn't working or it breaks down. Okay. So here's the amount of time that I had in mind, why I assigned things the way I did. So I assigned about 10 pages, right? That should take you 45 minutes, maybe. Find your own article and write down your presentations. That should take maybe an hour. Attend the class for two hours. Type up your post. That should take about 45 minutes because you've already done it. And I will, okay, the post can be 40, 400 words, right? So cut back. But you can't expect an A if you do the minimum, right? You can get a B, that's fine. But you know, when the professors have all those rubrics, says A, excellent, goes way beyond requirements, highly sophisticated, well-organized, whatever. And then a student, you know, will do the minimum amount. And why didn't I get an A? Like, <laughs> what are those rubrics for? So it's fine. Lots of you just do not have the time at this point. Just get a B, you know, life goes on. Um, I also require a paper each month. So that's every eight classes. I require a paper. The paper should take you about four hours, which would be adding about 30 minutes per class, right? So the total is five hours per class. It's a three hour class. It should take you two extra hours or two and a half, right? Since two classes is considered a full load in the summer, this would be 10 hours of school, or um, actually 20 hours of school as a full-time load, that's half. And again, you know, I know that 40 hours a week, nobody really spends 40 hours a week, but all I'm asking is for 20 hours a week, right? I'm asking for five hours per class, two classes a week. So 10 hours per class per week. In a summer session that you're only, you have to get permission to get a third class. So this is substantially less than it's supposed to be, but I, you know, if each step takes you more time, it shouldn't take twice as much time. Okay. Now, so many of you have gotten so far behind that, of course, it's going to take you way more time. But I'm not, you know, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, I did lower the requirements for the posts. Um, I'm available for office hours. I'll give you time during class. You don't have to be in class for three whole hours. Um, that's... That's what I can do, right? Okay, so here is, let's go back over the notebook entry. So, you know, many of you, you've, you've just gotten way too far behind. So I, whatever, however far behind you are, be prepared for the class before the class, right? Don't say I'm three weeks behind, so I, so, so I never can come prepared because I can't catch up. No, no. 
be prepared for that class so you can do the post right after that class. It's not going to be as good as if you had, you know, been able to do it step by step. But get it over with because this is not working for you, okay? So once again, you can review the quality of the posts. But if you're in a hurry and you've got to get it done, you just have to, you can't, you can't go to the higher levels of integrating all of it. You can try, um, but you, most of you just absolutely have to just get it done. Okay. So um, you could say, you know, I like this. I like this. I didn't like it because I wasn't raised that way. You know, that's, those are not very sophisticated reactions, but it's life. <laughs> and then you can say, oh, I was interested in the way the other classmate responded. Um, then at the higher level, so by this point in the class, after I've gone through that whole stream of all the things we've covered, you should understand what I mean when I say you look at the background, you think about a natural foundation, you think about the legacy of Western civilization and the science and technology revolution. You can, you know, just think about, you should be able to think about those things at this point. And then you should be able to think about your other classes, right? Do your other classes assume Francis Bacon's exploitation of nature? Or do they assume, assume a new paradigm that involves green integration sustainability? Or do they just, are they just no, neutral? They just stay out of it. They don't even talk about it. So, you, you know, thinking about that stuff is important. So that's, you know, a better post if you can start weaving things together. Then on your paper, right? So here's the requirements for a paper. You have to have a thesis statement. Um, if your thesis shows that you understand the course material, um, that you can analyze it, synthesize it, that your thesis, your thesis for this paper is what is my environmental eth or the legacy, right, of the West? What and you depth and the example I gave you was someone from Cambodia, what she sees with her eyeballs, right? What's going on in Cambodia is the result of this history. And the history isn't just about the French and the Cambodians and the, the way they forced them to make trade agreements and colonize them. It's also the philosophy. This is a philosophy class. What was the philosophy driving it? Francis Bacon, John Locke's view of property, Karl Marx's view of capitalism. Um, let's see, I mean, you. So, so as I showed you with that example, um, I do want your first paper to be about the legacy of the Western Enlightenment. Okay, then you have arguments. Um, and then you start out with quotes or ideas, either from what we read in class or from um, an outside source. You do not have to use an outside source on the first paper. It's not a long paper. Okay, and then you draw an argument. Okay, so you can have Bacon said, knowledge is power. The purpose of knowledge is to gain power. In my country, our whole educational system is about teaching science in order to control nature and improve our economy, right? And you give examples. That would be one thing, right? Um, anyway, you start out with a quote from Locke, property. Then you draw this inference. Yesterday, I talked to my neighbor about his cutting down trees, he said, I have a right to do what I want with my property, <laughs> right? That's what I want you to get, right? I'm just not sure of how many people in your countries 
truly have just completely absorbed that worldview, but you have to tell me. This is not six, this is three, okay? Because I have this rubric, but in the syllabus and in the stream, it says three, so three, right? Um, and then you have an example, and then you have a counterexample. Um, so in the, is it, so what do you think the causes are, right? Is that, can, can people in developing countries say that Western colonialism is the main cause or are the people in the developing countries complicit, compliant? I mean, they go along with it or not. Then you have paragraphs, your grammar is good, and the, you're able to synthesize things, and the application is important, and you're able to combine. Um, again, these things I think are uh, should make sense to you, that you're intellectually honest, committed to truth, fair to opposing views, but that's not as important in this particular paper. In the next paper or later on in the class, we start talking about faith, right? Religion and, and reason, right? And so, all right, so that's the paper requirements. Um, okay. So that was the idea. That was, you know, my reasoning behind how I organized the class. And I can help you as much as I can help you. I'm sorry a lot of you have gotten way behind. I, you know, but my only thing is please come prepared on the day we do stuff. We're sort of switching. Um, you should be able to refer to most of what we've already done for the purposes of a post by now, right? I gave you a shortcut. So now, um, so now I'm going to give you five minutes to, to write down notes from that reading. And of course, you know, if you haven't read it, that's a problem. Um, so what I can do is give you the cheat sheet, okay? I can give you the outline, but you know, that's not exactly, <laughs> um, you know, it's not a college level quality of education to sort of give you a cheat sheet and you react to the cheat sheet. But this was the, this is what I asked you to read. What is your thought? What are your thoughts about it? If you're not Muslim, that's okay. What do you know about Muslims? Maybe you live in a country that, you know, you know Muslims. I, I think most of you, even if you aren't Muslim, you know Muslims. Or this person is from Saudi Arabia, right? What do you know about how the Saudis treat the environment? Uh, how do Muslims behave according to what the what you hear in the news? So any of you could have any sort of reaction. And then um, if you are Muslim, of course, you should have a more interesting, engaged reaction. And the rest of us would want to listen to that and hear that, right? And then you, if you are Christian, you would want to compare Muslim and Christian. If you are neither, you would want you you might want to say it is interesting how similar Islam and Christian are compared to my tradition, which is Hindu or Buddhist, right? So okay, I'm going to give you five minutes um, to write, and I think each of you can can each of you get your own. Well, I'll, I'll make it smaller and I think it'll all fit on one page. If I make it small enough, can you see it if I make it small enough? Too small? I guess that's all the smaller it can get. Um, 
Anyway, so go ahead. I'll give you five minutes. And I'll turn off the recording here. Professor, any yes, idea? yes. Oh, we just need to write three ideas, right? The three main summer of the readings. That was what I said. But if you want to write more, because you have more time and you, you came prepared, please do. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna call on each of you 
And from now on, every class, I'll call on each of you twice, okay? So either we will have a basic reading and maybe we'll have, maybe it will be both of them based on readings that I gave you, but maybe it'll be one reading and one something you found yourself. So, um, Mosa, what did you think of the assigned reading? What reaction did you have? One of the reactions? Okay. Yes. Okay, Professor. So, what I understood from the reading is that so, um, according to that um, article, so it means all the things are created by God. For example, the humankind life, and these are assigned to be a particular you know system. For example, the Sharia, which is uh, talking about the law and how to you are going to you know um, uh, like. Uh, how you should spend your life and how you should, you know, uh, it, it's about, you know, protect the nature and it's about like, you know, ethical laws. So how we should do that. And at the same time, there are a lot of things and also uh, are required, for example, like, okay, let's go to the readings. Um, okay. And, and not only, like, for example, like um, there are a lot of things also part of, uh, uh, you know, under, uh, sorry, uh, part of the things who is circulated by uh, God and who is like, for example, like um, human can and also other creator, so other part of the nature and as a and and other thing is that so as you are human kind, so according to the most uh, as, I'm, as a Muslim, so as I know that like uh, human is the you know most uh, you know uh, what is the word. <laughs> I forgot the word. So, you know, the most preferable, not preferable exactly, uh, you know, creator, the most good creator of the God. And as a human human being, we have the responsibility only to, you know, save the nature. So as you are humans, we have more responsibilities on that. And, and also there are a lot of things we can use on by nature, but at the same time, we need to avoid unnecessary, you know, uh, things which are supposed not to do the way people are and the way now Muslim people are doing that's not said by you know by Islam and also what are the things that's in my memory I, that's okay I just, okay that's, okay so Sandani what about you Sandani? Are you there? Okay, so students need to go into the chat, right? Because I need to know either if your internet broke down or if you turned it on and went and did something else, right? Which I assume is not true. But the main point is what you communicate to me. So it's very possible that some of you have worked on the class for 50 hours or whatever, but you're what you've communicated to me is that you turned on your video, you went and did something else, and you haven't spent any time at all in the class. Like there's a number of students who haven't made clear to me that they've spent any time preparing at all. <laughs> okay. And that's, I'm sure that's not true. It's just that you, you must realize what you're communicating. Does that make sense? Mosa? you know, you have to remember, I'm not God, like, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> okay. And I, and I haven't been chasing you down or, you know, threatening you or giving a little quizzes or stuff. But you must communicate to me because on the one hand, you might have spent zero time. On the other hand, you might have spent 40 hours and I have no idea, right? Right. Some students might be doing YouTube videos and freaking out and just totally stressed and not doing a post because they're so worried. <laughs> and they don't come to office hours and they don't tell me. So all I'm 
you know, that outline is what I had in mind, right? This is what I had in mind. This was the plan. It seems like that would have been reasonable that you come prepared. <laughs> like, and no, Professor, I, I do actually, but my habit is when I say something, I couldn't look at my, you know, my, this is my bad habit. I couldn't look at my notebook. I'm just saying, you know, continuously. That makes me confused. Okay. I, 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 I took the notes, but when I'm speaking, I'm just speaking my, from my brain, what I have been understood. Right. But the main thing is you can get from your notes to your post immediately, right? You don't have to start all over, you know, and start all over with another three hours of YouTube. And, you know, I mean, please don't do that. <laughs> it's not okay. worth it. <laughs> so Sandani, I do not know if you turned on your machine and ditched, okay? You must communicate that there's more there than that. Um, Poppy, did you do anything? Okay, Kanich, what about you? Yes, ma'am, and I have something to share also. Good. Yeah, so I think I do agree with what um, our senior says just right now. And also I took uh, notes that there was written that um, only humans have duty to protect the environment. And second thing is um, environment policy has been influenced by Islam. So what I think is that uh, my opinion is that it's not true for the last one that I took notes. Uh, environment policy has been influenced by Islam. But what I think that there is a lot of things that doing by other religions that is still is really good and, and I appreciate them for it because um, there are such as if you say for the examples for the Christian religions, they have become really uh, calm and quiet because I have some friend in UW and I mix with them. But for the peoples in Islamic religions, they are really like uh, so quick and like, um, uh, like how to say, I forgot the word. So I, what I think that uh, Christian peoples are more like uh, so calm and quiet, like they don't really want to talk much, but for the Islamic peoples, uh, they're also good, they're kind, but they're like uh, so rash or like they're quick things, they like to do something like that. So I think uh, environment policy has not been influenced by Islam, but uh, other religious also, it's not, can, it cannot be doing by Islam. And okay, so that's the bigger question, who is influencing policy, right? Yeah, I think it's all, all the, all the religious peoples, like all the creation, not only Islam. I think it's, it's not, it's not true, in my opinion. All right, and then you can think about your country as opposed to other countries, and then the other thing to think about, which I'll get to, is. If you remember, Lynn White said that religion is the problem and religion is the solution. Whereas Mr. Moncrief said, it's not religion, it's science and technology and industry and democracy and development, right? And so and so that you can, that's another way to think critically. It really isn't the religion's fault people are just caught up in this historical change and, the, and they've gotten caught up in the industrialization and in the industrial era from the modern Western world. But we've, we really have to switch the paradigm. And then, the, and then the next step is, should we use religion to help us switch paradigms? Or is that too tainted? by um, using religion to justify exploiting nature? Or do you think religion would be a good way to do a foundation for going green for policy? Does that make sense, Kanij? Uh, yeah, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. Is that kind of what you were going for? Yeah, that's why I asked. Uh, yeah, I asked. Yeah, okay. okay. I, it's just, 
just developing this, you know, ability to think critically, right? They say that, they do that, wait a sec, what's the cause? You know, is it corrupt religion or is it just industrialization and democracy? And, you know, there's lots of different causes and they, in a culture, they all combine into a paradigm. That's why I talk about paradigm. And then how difficult it is going to be to shift a paradigm because so many aspects of culture have just been saturated with um, development means fossil fuel using development, right? Okay, good. Kajis, that's great. That's why I want you to come prepared, right? Because then we can have a conversation. Otherwise, I just think students get scared and they, they just freeze up, some of them, right? It's, it's too complicated. It's not, if you can start, if you know, you know, there's a starting point and then you can just start building from it. Okay. So, Sauda, do you have something? Hey, yes, professor. Uh, okay. So when I was like reading the text, uh, the article, so there was some minor stuff that I didn't, you know, that kind of confused me. But overall, what I got was like every single thing in here, it's all, you know, targeted towards the believers, right? So if I don't believe in, uh, you know, God, or I don't fear God, I don't fear the consequences, or I don't, you know, have any that faith, then it doesn't really matter. So there is a, like all of the reasoning here and everything that, you know, that's like advocating for environmental protection all of the reasoning, if I don't believe in God, then I, they will be all like, you know, disposable to me. I won't, I wouldn't care. Like those reasons does, wouldn't apply to me. So that's like the main thing that I noticed. So, I mean, there is nothing other than like, it's all really God centric. So if I, if I if I take that out of it, then all of the reasoning wouldn't, you know, right. make sense. Question. So that's like a huge thing. So if we make religion uh, one reason, like if we take inspiration from that and we make these reasoning our main reasoning for like environmental protection and everything, it wouldn't work for people it won't work for like all of us. It will only work for a handful of people. So we have to find something that resonates with everybody. Good, that's good. So then my next question is the United Nations, right? The United yeah. Nations has that capabilities model and they're very, very into climate issues. Um, now, people who, is it possible, Saudi, in your view, right, to be a basically secular humanist environmentalist who, you know, you, the UN capabilities approach is what you use as your model. Now, is it possible for you to say, I can work with Muslims because a lot of Muslim countries have signed on to the UN, right? And the Paris Agreement. So, right, the Paris Agreement is supposed to be designed so that all sorts of people who have religious reasons will still sign on to sustainability, right? So do you think it's possible? Do you think that what the world is trying to do as we have this paradigm shift is possible and legitimate. And you could say to somebody who's Muslim like this, sure, you can have those reasons and those aren't my reasons, 
But as long as we engage in the same behavior, right? If we all agree that truthfulness is important, you know, your source of truth is God, my source of truth is reason, protecting life is important, conserving the environment is important, sustained development is important. You say to God, I say to the future, to my grandchildren, I owe them a world, <laughs> right? Yes. Okay, Saudi, do you think it's possible to build a bridge? Yes, I, like absolutely. Because even though the, you know, reasonings are different or like the emotions are different, uh, even if our like, we're going, coming from different paths, the end goal is same. So like the Sorry. end result that we all want, it's the same. So that's, that's why, I, yeah, good. That's why I wanted you at this point to write a paper, paper, right? Where you start doing that, right? So it'd be the yeah. first step in, like your first paper could be something like, okay, I like the UN thing. Or you could go and find the Paris Agreement if you want to, and all the states that have signed on. And then you could say, if you want to say this, right? <laughs> you know, moving forward, I think we should do it this way. I'm willing to work with Muslims. And then if, again, because you're handing in a late, I don't care if you use this, you could use one brief quote, you know, from this article that just says, truthfulness, protecting life. I'm on board with that. And they do it for God. And I do it for my grandchildren. And that's fine with me. Just that's the kind of thing you could write in your paper, because I just want you to gradually, step by step, to be weaving the stuff together. Does that make sense to you, Saudi? Uh, yes, Professor. Good. Um, just find something in your gut that you really care about, right? That's why I leave it open, because I really don't want students to worry about pleasing me. <laughs> I just want whatever. You know, some students, I've had students that say, I hate clerics, get religion out of my life. And, um, you know, if they really believe we can't work with religion, we've got to make this purely secular and they give good reasons. Um, and then I just say, do you think that'll work? You know, are there too many politicians who, if they say this is purely secular, it's not going to go over? I mean, there is this problem of trying to persuade people to get on board, right? So. Yeah, like we have to, right? I mean, if we always look at what's dividing us, we will like, never get anything done we have to look towards what's common what like resonates with all of us so. well that's, that's what you would write in your paper right i mean it might seem obvious to you right but i i'm a philosopher and, and students have their free right i'm totally into you know free thought um see what kind of arguments you can come up with but if that's your conviction, then that's, that's great. Um, Sristi, what about you? Okay. Um, Fahima, are you there? I know that you are. If your electricity is there, you're there. Ahima is one that really has electricity problems. She lives in Taliban country. <laughs> um, Burl, Afghanistan, that's some of the worst. So Fahima, anybody who's been cut off, let me know and I'll come back, you know, and call on you again. Okay. Um, so Fahima, have you did you read it already? Have you read it? Okay, I lost her again. 
Okay, Neetu, what about you? Um, professor, from the reading, what I am, like what I have understood is like Islamic Sharia follows two main grounds to be uh, righteous in their action, like which are moral and legal grounds. Uh, some of the things are more wrong, but legally allowed those activities are uh, both were wrong, which is are haram or restricted or forbidden in Islam. Uh, for example, uh, wasting a lot of water in while like cleaning yourself, doing odu is makru, and other activities like harming other living things is restricted in Islam. So, uh, as the sh uh, Sharia follow Quranic instructions, according to that, uh, Almighty Lord has created every. Thing. That is so frustrating for students. In this world, uh, from the littlest creatures to <clears throat> so Muslim did by God. Yeah. Oh, Professor, oh. could you hear me? Uh, it comes in and out. So maybe I'll ask you a question and maybe it'll, you know, respond or you can type an answer. Um, so here's what I'm thinking. Um, are you Muslim, right? Are you Muslim? Uh, yes, professor. Okay, and have you studied environmental issues related to Islam before? Professor, couldn't you hear me when like, I was? I could hear some of it. Uh, uh, Just Okay, uh, should I repeat myself? Like, I'm not sure what happened. Yeah. I was, I was saying. So actually, I said that what I got was that there's a moral and legal aspect to Islam, and it's forbidden to waste water, and it's forbidden to harm living things, right? And so. What I wanted to ask you is, first of all, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, we are doing. Um, so what I was thinking was, did you, in high school or you know, religious study, was the connection between Islam and environmental sustainability? Were you taught that as part of? your other religious education? Uh, not explicitly, but yeah, implicitly, uh, Islam uh, teaches us to be like, uh, be, you know, uh, be cautious towards environment and to protect it. Okay. Um, all right, so do you think, okay, do you think um, in order to move toward a different paradigm, do you think religion would be a positive tool to use or negative or just neutral? Or do you think there are a lot of people that political leaders are going to have to use religion in order to you um, convince them? I think uh, religious both, uh, religious can be both and advantages and disadvantages because, you know, some people uh, misinterpret and uh, use it for their own goods and, you know, so, you know, instructed in the religion. So, uh, hello? Yep. Oh, okay, I thought I was disconnected. So, uh, like, some people can use uh, uh, some of the inf uh, information uh, misinterpreting to, uh, you know, 
misguide people and um yeah which can be harmful and you know uh, and okay okay so um, what i the purpose of liberal education right is to liberate yourself and so educated people should be able to see through called corruption or you know socialization that's harmful and speak out so that's just a major thing so in your papers if you want to if you want to use examples of when political leaders have misinterpreted Islam, or if they basically ignore it because they want development and development means fossil fuels. And so they just don't talk about religion. <laughs> or, you know, how does that work in your country? Is what I'm curious about, because in my country, we are the only country, right, that left the Paris Accord. Where the Trump is one of very few political leaders that actually gets rewarded for saying it's a hoax, right? And so mm -hmm. at that, but I mean, that's why I taught you what I taught you so far. Otherwise, I don't see how you could possibly understand it. But then the question is for each of you, like how is it that your situation? and your political leaders or your socialization or whatever. Um, and where do you see your country going forward? Or where do you see the new paradigm? Does your country pay a lot of attention to the UN? Or do people basically look to religious leaders? Or who is the guide, right? And then, um, and then, the other question is, is there a way for leaders who mm -hmm. refer to Islam to also work with secular humanists without being accused of being corrupt or something like that? So what do you think? Um, I think that I'm, I'm like not very sure about it, but uh, I think in my country, like religion is like a very big issue. Political uh, leaders often uh, for the betterment of the nation and its people. Um, then and um. The big outrages, they, uh, you know, uh, get very angry when, like, when it something is related to their religion, even if it's not, if it's showed like the way it's related, uh, and you know, they get pretty angry about that. And okay, so I guess my main point is that you can just keep thinking through that stuff. And your first paper would be your first step in that. Um, right. So, yeah, Srisi is um, Hinduism. Sorry, Professor. I was, uh, I was in the washroom. Okay. That's, okay. That's all right. So I'll do Rasi and two, and then I'll come to you, Srisi, okay? Okay, Professor. Yeah, no, great. And then... I'm, we're going to have three more people, and then we'll take a break, okay? Um, so, Rossi, what you got? So, after reading about the Islamic environmental ethics, I when I came through a quote saying that a person does not live in a vacuum, but is affected by outside influences, which may corrupt the ability to choose between good and evil, on page 320 and i think that this statement is very accurate and it reminds me of when people say that a child is born as a blank sheet of paper and that white blank sheet of paper can be easily 
either damaged, drawn on, or beautifully painted upon, depending on the atmosphere and the environment they are surrounded by. Say that child grew up in a family that is greedy and always destroying the environment. They grew up thinking that it's very okay for them to do that. And before they knew it, they are already entangled in that belief that destroying the environment is very okay. However, those who grew up by the side of parents and neighbors who love the environment, who care to plant trees, who care to consider every action that they take in order to protect and save creatures, then they will grow up loving the environment, growing up um, believing that every bit that they do can have a harmful impact and they are really cautious when they do something. And it's very similar to the Buddhist point of view too, because Buddhists care that people grew up with this um, thought that when they do something, there, sh there shouldn't be an intention to kill or harm the animals because that is considered as a karma seed because people have that vision beforehand however if something is beyond their control if they create something with the intention to help but rather harm it's not as sinful as with the real intention to just harm okay good yeah so another thing for you to think about is um the difference between islam and like hindu or buddhist or secular right and in some places he distinguishes himself he says it's not like aristotle it's not like um paganism i think he even says hinduism it's a different foundation now oh yeah they're okay they're not based on human reasoning socialization or class struggle which would be karl marx right uh, socialization would be Max Weber, or actually it would be uh, Jeremy Bentham. So I do want you to get the sense, right? All these guys have read Aristotle, Bentham, Kant. They've all read this stuff. And so, um, and so he says that values are eternal and unalterable, right? Unlike much more natural, plus um, Hindu and Buddhist is a much more fluid idea. It's not a law-based idea. So then the question is, you know, does that mean we can't work together or like uh, Sauda might want to say, you know, on the one hand, he presents these as different, but there's no reason at the level of practice that we can't work together. And that's what the UN, the United Nations is aware of these differences, but they still are completely committed to the fact, to the claim that we can work together. It's just that um, people, believers who are fixated on a doctrine and who are intolerant or religious leaders who get more votes by being intolerant they can certainly use these doctrines because there's an opening there for class struggle, right? For struggle, animosity, to wep use religion as a weapon. So it, the, you know, it's very important how you use the religion. And I also think it's important to know how much of these traditions really are consistent with sustainability, even though they have doctrines that could instantly be used as weapons. But so each of you has to sort of, I want you to just understand that and then, you know, understand what goes on around you because political leaders educated, the educated class sort of knows all this stuff. And so they figure out which button, like they're in the cockpit of an airplane and they decide, well, which buttons am I going to punch so I can get this baby off the ground, you know? And so it really does matter that, that you're educated and you know the background. Public education, right? Policy, these things are important, um, but they do have 
these tools, right? The philosophy is um, can be a tool for good or evil. Um, all right. So, um, Chu, is that your name? Yes. <clears throat> yes, Professor. Two. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Professor, uh, pardon me, I didn't read the class material. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. do you understand though how you're making life so much harder for yourself? Right? Yes, yeah. okay. I I really do want you to understand that. Um because I do feel really bad about this now, how many hours unnecessarily students will have to um use to make up. But you know, I'm sort of like the cheat sheet. I do think office hours could help cut cut your time if you want to use me that way. But anyway, okay, Sristi, what about you? Yes, Professor. Go ahead. What did you want to say? Oh, yeah. Okay. So my religion on environmental ethics, it's like uh, Hinduism believes everything in our environment is sacred and the uh, our God is the only creator, protector, and destroyer of everything. So we should abide by God and serve him. And our religion believes like there is the existence of God um, inside every human being and living being. So we must act gently with everyone and respect each other in the community and serve the nature. Of course, uh, our religion like strictly prohibit cutting trees and hurting the nature because have I have already said like we have uh, we believe there is God existence and in every living being being and only god has the power to destroy them so we cannot hurt them and we have the right um for example like ancient hindus and even still in some countries hindus worship the nature and such as trees mountains etc and then it's like uh, in our religion human are not superior than other animals and living beings they're all equal so as nature is serving us with food and existence of animals are insects are also important for the nature and the world so we also must protect them so i think it's somewhere different from islam but also it has some similarities with islam and other religions as well okay did you grow up with your parents sort of yes. modeling that kind of behavior I, yes okay um there's also this issue that these Muslim countries are, are zillionaires based on oil, right? And so, yes. that, yeah, that gets to be a problem because <laughs> you get, you know, money mixed up with religion and, and like Karl Marx would say, it gets, it gets pretty tricky, right? And it's so easy then to use religion to justify your oil wealth. I mean, I can imagine, I don't know. It's just like not hard. Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it's not hard at all to think that people in Saudi Arabia think, somebody sure does, that when the US and the West got so corrupt, God uh, allowed enabled the Saudis to find that oil because they want Islam to dominate the world, right? And then that could justify all this using oil to uh, promote their domination. So I don't think it's much of a stretch. I'm sure there's lots of people that actually believe that. It's just, I don't read everything that's ever been written. But um, so then the question is, what are we going to do about this? Because that's not where we're going. So after the break, what I'm going to do is we go back to the debate about Christianity. So I so that you notice, right, that the disagreements between the three people uh, about the cause. You know, Lynn White said it was religion, and Moncrief said no. It was, you know, it was modernity. And then Dobal says, yeah, but religion, you know, okay. So I just want you to think, 
could you apply a lot of those same patterns to Islam, right? Is is you you know is Islam legitimately um, promoting fossil fuels because that's their way? God wants them to do that so they can dominate the world. Um, you know, kind of colonialism, a kind of Mid East colonialism, or is it? Um, it doesn't have anything to do with Islam. Islam itself, right, was not promoting that but the real cause is just all of this other stuff right the industrialization the development of the Middle east and then if you go back to the roots of islam it actually advocates something consistent but anyway so i'm going to give you a break i have 12 minutes after and so we can break till 20 minutes after. But there's one thing I do want to point out is that for each of the students that came prepared, that's what I like to do as a teacher, right? I like to just take them maybe a step further and you know expand their minds and ask them questions. And so it's partly hard, you know, it's impossible if you don't come prepared, which I understand you have so many things. It also is hard when the machines break down and it's hard, you know, there's so many obstacles. It was so much easier when we were all in a room <laughs> and people were getting excited and they could see other people getting excited. Um, and so I apologize for any kind of way that this class has has become overwhelming in your minds, but I will work with you in any way I can, right? To get you excited about the material, to get you motivated, to finish, you know, to get it together, you know, get caught up and then stay caught up and not feel overwhelmed. Um, but anyway, so let's take a break till 20 after, okay?
Okay, so <clears throat> um, the next thing I asked you to do for today, let's see. Oh, okay. Um, excuse me. So do you think, um, all right, do you think religion uh, the victory of Christianity over paganism. Well, what about the victory of Islam over paganism also, right? So Islam is also this view, you know, with a creator God, with God's laws, as opposed to just bubble up, right? Um, seeing... Um, Oh, paganism had that every living thing had a spirit, right? Um, let's see. So how much Christianity bears a, a huge burden of guilt? Um, we need a new religion, okay? Now think of this with Islam, right? Does Islam bear a burden of guilt for fossil fuel? Uh, pollution, or um, does it need to be rethought? Um, is it true that since the roots of the problem are religious, that the remedy is religious in the case of Islam? Um, and then do you agree with Moncrief that um, all these social institutions are interconnected and Weber, okay, so so the Islamic writer disagrees with this, right? That it's Aristotle, natural reason, or socialization, or Marxist class struggle, right? It's about capitalism. Um, but this writer, Moncrief, says that it's too simplistic to say it's about religion and it's affected by religion, but religion's not the primary conditioner of human behavior. They've been impacting the environment. Um, okay, so the alternative hypothesis, why do we have this crisis? People tend to be egocentric and there are status hierarchies Everybody wants a better life. Um, and now there is this revolution toward more democracy all over the world, right? Supposedly countries that were monarchies are now democracies or aristocracies are now democracies, supposedly. So Rossi wrote her paper about the pseudo democracy of Cambodia. So Karl Marx would say it's really just the rule of the rich. Um, and Moncrief would say, wait, you know, you have to include the rich. How did they get rich? Well, they get rich through exploiting natural resources, right? And so this exploiting resources has gotten combined with social mobility and democracy with whatever religion, right? <laughs> And now it's Christian or Islam, and then Hindu, Buddhist, are, the, are all the religions getting corrupted by this, um, ex, this exporting or development of developing countries, and that means fossil fuel development combined with democracy or people having more social mobility, right? They can have a more comfortable life. It's very compelling. Right? You can have a refrigerator and you don't have to, you know, do all that labor it took to keep your food from spoiling. Or you can have uh, water in your house rather than walking miles every day. I mean, this stuff makes it's very compelling. So how do we how do we deal with this? Um, then you don't have to worry about the American situation. But what are the causes of the crisis? Democracy, technology, urbanization, wealth, 
uh, an aggressive attitude toward nature, and then the religious traditions, right? Not just Judeo-Christian. How about these other traditions? Um, are they the root of the problem? Are they gonna, are they root, the root of the solution to the problem? Or are they just one other part of culture? Um, and then this one is, okay. So what do you think, uh, each of you, I'm gonna, you know, ask each of you, do you agree? Or what do you think is the root cause? How does religion stand in relation to how to get us out of this fossil fuel paradigm into a green paradigm, right? What should the place of religion be? So Poppy, have you got something? So Sada, what about you? So uh, if I think about religion, well, in general, it's uh, about self-preservation, right? So we can use any Thing. We can use reason, we can also use religion and, you know, take aspects of it and use it as reason to, you know, convince people. So, like, if we, uh, if we talk about, like, religion tells us it's, like, uh, forbids, it tells people to be kind. And then it's also, like, forbids, like, uh, suicide. And you know, killing yourself or whatever, or killing off uh, animals and everything. Uh, so you can, like, for example, here, like we read the article today, and it says you uh, like all the nat nature, your environments, everything that's on this earth is a blessing from God, and you know, we are supposed to use it, but we can't, you know destroy it we have to protect it as well since it's a blessing from god and even i, I remember uh, in one part it says even if it's like we know that tomorrow is doomsday and the arts will be destroyed anyway we still have to protect it we, we still can't abuse the gift that god gave us so we still have to protect it so those are things and aspects that we can take and say, use it in our arguments that like, it's all a gift for us and uh, we're supposed to use it and it's forbidden for us to just destroy it because it's a means to self-preservation for us. So if we are destroying the uh, environment and nature that God gave us, we are destroying the habitable art that God gave us in order for us to survive. So we are indirectly harming our own selves and like bringing our own extinction. So God forbid us from destroying them because he knew that it's important for our survival. So we have to protect it. Okay. The other thing you could notice if you want to is the close, how similar this is to Patrick Dobal's view of the stewardship of the earth, that God gave it to us as stewards and we're supposed to pass it on to the next generation. I mean, both of them say that, right? It's uh, yeah. amazing how close, how close they are. Even though politically, you know, if you read the newspaper, you're never going to think they're close. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like we, you can find common ground in everywhere. I feel like in the end, it's all about the same thing. Okay, good. Um, Sristi, what about you? Do you have a comment about? Um, 
what the causes of the problems are and what the cure is going to be. Professor, uh, I kind of like agree with Sauda in this point. So how would you, is, that oh, we, yes? yeah, well, how would you reframe what she said? Yeah, it's, uh, it's like we cannot like clearly blame the religion entirely, but it is uh, somewhat connected to uh, how people are using it against uh, for their own like own country's betterment and it so is like religion didn't uh, religion didn't tell people to do things in this way but uh it's like their economy is developing and everything um okay like in the in the economic development are people looking at it as more democracy and also people are able to move up the status ladder so like mr moncrief says people are motivated to do it for these other reasons. Is that happening in your country? That people are able to move up to a better life and they, they think their country is more democratic, they're voting and their, you know, their standard of life is going up and so they thank God for that, but they don't stop using fossil fuels. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Okay. This is also, this is the similar. Also, uh, I I have read it in somewhere like the less, um, the less religious the people of the country is, the more the GDP is. But I think this is, um, this is this doesn't work in my country. Like it's like people are too much religious, but also the G GDP is also increasing so i don't know like they are using the religion to make all this and right okay good that's good because um sometimes when a country goes secular that would mean more fossil fuel use but sometimes it means less right because they're gonna go secular um humanist green right and people think the real green, you know, the green people of the world are not religious, right? So, yes. yeah, so secular can mean either one. It can mean worse greed or it can mean green, you know? So I, I do want you to be aware of all that, all those different sort of um, patterns and movements that are going on in developing countries right now. Um, Nitu, do you have something about what you think the causes are? If religion, how much of a role religion plays in this, uh, what's going on? Professor, could you ask that again, please? The question I, I is, like is, religion, is religion the cause of this degeneration of the environment or, and is religion going to be a cure, right? We have to turn to religion, Lynn White said, or is it Moncrief that it's people are moving up to a higher standard of living, they're able to vote, it's fossil fuels that gets them there, and that's the real cause and religion is one factor in a culture but it's not really the determining factor what do you think um what are the first one you said go ahead Kanish. uh what is the first one you said the religious is what is religion the, the cause of the problem. And if it is, that's what Lynn White said, then the only way to get to a sustainable situation 
is to get a better religious model, right? In his case, change to St. Francis. Or is religion a factor in culture? And what's really driving the culture is more like what Karl Marx said, which is industrialization, democracy, people's standard of living is going up and they, their, their countries officially have become democracies. Um, and religion is just one other aspect of the culture. So it's not religion is not the primary driver. It's actually um, science and the exploitation of nature for human well-being and a higher standard of living. That's what's causing it. I think uh, religion is not uh, the thing uh, for uh, democracy or other things, but right now there is a lot of policy and a uh, lot of things going on up on this. Uh, people are fighting about this. So what is my opinion is that uh, religion is not for uh, just the, like in conflict that brings in the environment and also uh, any kind of things that uh, make a uh, conflict between people. So it, it's not a policy or, or it's not a thing that people can do uh, democracy over there. But what I think that it's a, it's a way that we can make a really peaceful society in the society, but uh, people are not really obey the rules uh, rightly right now, I think. Okay, so if you wanted to write your paper on that, that would be fine, right? But you definitely should write your post about that, that issue, right? Because that's today's one of today's main themes. Um, so Foreman, do you have a view of the place of religion in moving toward a green paradigm? OK. Two, do you have something? No, Larissa. Neetu, do you have something? Um, not really, Professor. I, I'm, I'm still thinking about that. OK. Read about Professor, uh, I had a yeah. question. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, like, uh, if people like, uh, if the country people using, uh, stop using religion in the way, for example, um, in the way like uh, they use religion to increase the economy or increase the wealth of the country. So, for example, like, what if they stop using this? So, what about the economy afterwards? And will people be able to get convinced and still still contribute to the economy? Like, what about the economy of the country? afterwards if the scenario happens and will there should be an alternative way to think about it or they should just stop it okay and then we have to remember it's just it's a green economy right it's a sustainable eco economy so the reason why some people say religion is good is because religion came from a time when people did have respect for nature, right? Because they didn't have that much technology and they, they couldn't get power over it, right? So um, for example, in this article on Islam, he says there's the legal and the moral, God's laws and then how we're supposed to live. Whereas Bacon, Francis Bacon said that nature, studying nature so the Islamic guy studying nature teaches you laws, God's laws. The Francis Bacon studying nature teaches you God's power. And then studying the Bible teaches you God's will. So your morals are over there. Like don't be greedy and don't be violent, whatever. But over here, you understand God's power but you understand it in order to gain power over it, right? 
And so none of those religions say that, right? They say, you know, this is God's creation. You shouldn't abuse it. But John Locke, Francis Bacon were unique in the sense God wants us to cut down the trees and plow the land and all that stuff. So ancient cultures don't advocate exploiting it as much as possible, right? For human well-being. They don't. Yes. You know, they have this sin of overstepping your bounds. Does that make sense? Yes, Professor. Okay. Um, Mosa, I don't think I, do you want to uh, check in, have an opinion? Uh, <laughs> yes, Professor, but uh, like, what are the things you want to know, like, about the religion things, right? And how does that, and like, what's really causing this destruction of the environment? What's the real cause? And professor, in this case, like, um, if I talk about the religion, this doesn't, uh, I intend to blame on, you know, uh, religion because uh, uh, religion doesn't say that, okay, just do the, um, like, you know, mm, because man, mostly these things people are doing for their own development, right? As the like, previous speaker said, the economic development. So in this case, like religion is doesn't entirely blame, but people are, uh, people are, you know, the, um, it doesn't matter which religion belongs to because there are a lot of people you can find from Christian and then Hindu and then Muslims. People are using that, destroying their nature, the environment, the, because of their own benefit and their own development. So in this case, I, I could say that a human is the, a human is the, you know, uh, most responsible for this. And on the other hand, if we, if we could say that, okay, except religion. So uh, we could say that like, for example, and a lot of things happen around the world, uh, like modernization, industrialization. So what are happening? These are happening because they're on, they, they want the development, right? And the country's development. So um, in order to doing, doing so, so if I give an example from China, for example, um, in the world, China, is the most, China and US, they're making so many, they're, you know, using so many fossil fuels and then making the environment, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, like unex unexpected, not unacceptable, like, you know, uh, people are, you know, uh, uh, can't, sorry, I lost myself. So the, they're making the earth, you know, so that people can't living because the global warming. Why, what they're happening? Because the modernization, industrialization, right? So these are the things happening and these things only happening from science, technology, you could say, I can blame everything, not only religion. And do you understand, Professor? <laughs> Did it make sense? Yeah, and then the question is, do you think religion's irrelevant or do you think it would be a useful, uh, I mean, if we have to get people to think differently and think in terms of sustainability, is religion a good, part of that rethinking. Okay, <laughs> Professor, in this case, I could say that like, okay, so no religion said to harm anything, right? So uh, it's only for believers. So if we really think that, okay, um, if we really follow the religions, we could do, and we could save the environment, but, uh, but the way people are doing, it doesn't work because religions, saying something, people doing something. And really, most of the, for example, in Bangladesh, so we, yeah, as, as all people know that okay, Bangladesh is a secular country, but there are a lot of people in Islamic, you know, scholar and then other polit political re leaders, they're using religion as a weapon for the, you know, development, for the economical development. So in this case, it doesn't going to work. So what I have to do that, we have to find a common ground, like, you know, uh, is going to work for everyone who is believers or not doesn't matter right I, I, yeah so, so that is the question how do we find the common ground and if you think people have associated religion with fossil fuel 
and it's hopeless corrupt right the association is just people go to the mosque and then they go to the mall right right absolutely yeah okay it's it's socialization so if they've been socialized in a way that makes religion completely complicit with fossil fuel extraction do you just have to dump it and say in a in the next paradigm we've just got to keep religion out of it or not even talk about it or just look here's if you really think you're muslim you got to really be muslim and that means green right yes those are the questions that i want you to think about that's all so Rossi, what do you think do you think cambodia as a buddhist country could you know that buddhism would be a a positive mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, for me, I think that Cambodia is a I mean, Buddhist country. Yes. However, there's still the minor, like the minority who define themselves as Buddhist, but they don't follow the Buddhist principles and stuff. And I believe that when Cambodians actually follow the Buddhist principle, then the environment here will be so much better because Buddhism is pro environment and they support the environmental movement where they teach and raise awareness of the environmental crisis and how to help birth heal. I think that if they follow that, we will be in a really better place and finding green energy and green technology will be a lot faster than, at, than this current rate. Okay, so here's another issue for all of you in your countries. So the UN has an influence, I think, and the NGOs influence. But those, those organizations are associated with secular humanism, right? And so the question, you know, is it would somebody working in Cambodia be better off bringing in Buddhism or because people associate you know, they think they're Buddhist and they go to the mall and they don't have any problem or they cut down trees, that it would be better to just get them to rethink or moving forward. What do you think would be the best way for somebody to be persuasive, to sort of be able to move a country into a new paradigm? Should they include Buddhism? For me, I think it would be good if they include Buddhism, but I think that a lot of the religions on earth has some sort of philosophy relating to saving the environment and putting humans the task of making sure that we are taking care of all the creatures here. So it doesn't have to necessarily be Buddhism, but surely we do need a reminder telling people that telling people of our duties and we can use their religions to back them up because Hinduism, Islam all have like an aspect to that. So, yeah. I mean, the other thing is it just seems like destroying God's creation would be the number one human sin. Like what could be worse than that? Right? Pride. <laughs> I mean, yeah. In Christianity, pride is the worst sin. And the devil tried to make himself into God, right? Well, isn't that what we're doing? <laughs> I, you know, it seems so obvious to me, but, but you know, it's also obvious that people think they're religious and they spend their lives at the mall, you know, shopping or window shopping or fantasizing about the next big thing to buy, and they don't have any. Like they don't seem to have cognitive dissociation where, you know, because I study the philosophies, I just think, how can you do that? Right. And, and so, I mean, we, you know, remember Bentham and Mill, that's why I wanted to teach you that happiness, pleasure, and pain. If we are blank slates, boy, we have really been molded right, to get our happiness out of exploitation.
education and to ignore it's religion. capitalism, professor. What? It's capitalism, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's what Karl Marx says, right? And Karl Marx, of course, hates all religion. So he's a flaming atheist. Um, so yeah, I, I do want you to see how everything I've assigned you so far, far is actually really interconnected, right? Um, okay, so Raihana, do you have something? Okay, and um, Fahima, are you there? Okay, my next question is, I did ask you to read your own article. <laughs> your mic is not working. You actually typed up your mice is not working, but that's all right. I'm a bad typist too. <laughs> I'm notorious for typos. Um, all right. So did anybody go and read an, an extra article and bring it to present today? So I'll just call on you and see if you did, because the reading itself was pretty short. So that's why I did that. So Mosa, did you bring anything? Poppy, did you prepare anything on your own? Sauda? Uh, yes, Professor. Okay. So, uh, so I like uh, read this the article that I read. It's a uh, it's from BBC and it's about uh, it's titled "Religion Can Make Us More Environmentally Friendly or Not." And the whole article kind of uh, you know uh, talks about like different religions starts with Jainism, then Christianity, and then uh, Islam, Buddhism, and, you know, relates everything together and, you know, gives out examples of each religion and how it, it advocates uh, environmental friendly messages. So, I, I'm not sure how much should I say. It's, uh, the article is pretty long. I'm I'll, do you want me to like put a link in the chat? I'll yes. do that. Why don't you put a link in the chat and I will put it as an attachment. And if students mm -hmm. um, want to, again, I only asked you to find something five, six pages. You don't have to read the whole thing. Um, and then mm -hmm. if students want to read that instead of something they found themselves, but this is I ask you to do it because I, you know, we can all learn a lot. So it's from the BBC, is that right? Did you say? Uh, yes, Professor. Okay, very good. Do you want me to like read out some key points or something? Or I'm um, not sure how. What should why I don't you read out three key points? That'd be great. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'm just uh, okay. I'll put the link right now here. Okay. And then I'll read it. Uh, send. There we go. I think I, okay, I, I sent it in the chat. So I think everyone can just create the code that if they want. And so, okay. So there's, I'll just read out some uh, examples. So it, uh, one thing uh, it says, so Let's start with Islam. So in here it says, in Tanzania, they have created an like Islamic eco-village for orphans. So one local, uh, wait, I just lost it again. Okay. So the founder, so a, it was like uh, in, it, it's, it was founded by Islamic Foundation for Ecology and Environmental Sciences, and its founders started the organization in 1980s uh, because of his passion for nature, and he studied uh, theology at university and, you know, uh, connected Islam, 
uh, intrinsically with environmental friendly uh, protection. He noticed that Muslims had lost their connection with nature because like so many other people, they had become preoccupied with wealth. So he set up the uh, organization IFES uh, to show Muslim the core teachings of the Quran that convey environmentalist ethics. Uh, similar, there's a lot of example here, Professor. It's, there's another one in Indonesia which is a country rich in biodiversity, but under the threat from development. Uh, uh, IFES is like working with schools to re restore the rainforests. And in Tanzania, they created an Islamic eco village for orphans, where they're establishing renewable energy plants and recycling projects. So the eco village was like built based on the practices of the profit and how to like ma manage natural resources. Yep, okay, very good. So yep. everybody can look at that if they want to, but yeah, it's not that hard, right? Sada, it's not that hard to type in something and come up with an article, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't think anyone should be too frightened by the assignments. And then we can all, you know, everybody gets to hear everybody else's, um, what they found. Um, and then you can, you know, you can sort of know that whenever you want to find out stuff about this for papers for this class or just in general, there's lots and lots of information out there. So, um, Sristi, did you find something on your, find something? Uh, yes, Professor. Uh, should I share the link to? Sure. Give me, give me a minute. Okay. Um. All right. So while we're waiting, I'll just, oh, there it is. Okay, good. Go ahead. Uh, Yes, Professor. So it is actually based on the relation between religion and climate change. And the article is mostly like focused on Australia. So there are some parts like I have went through specifically. Should I uh, should I note the paragraphs too? Yeah, uh, it's really long, right? You don't. Yeah. So I, 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 I will I will give the paragraph numbers in the chat box okay. I'm giving right now okay good and then you can just describe you know those points and yeah okay okay professor Professor, uh, it will take me some time, like. All right, so let, I'll just call on somebody else then. Who else? Um, Nitu, did you have something? Uh, yes, Professor, but I couldn't find any shorter article. So the article I just found, it's pretty big. So I just scanned through that. Uh, yeah, you don't have to spend a lot of time on it. Yeah. What was the main thesis? That's all you have to report in, and that's all you actually, have to Professor. I uh, yes, Professor. I have read an article uh, of Deadless and.
like where uh, hate religion and they have, but uh, most of the religion uh, think nature as a sacred object. So uh, he approached in a way like uh, if it's uh, and it's a sacred object, it, it has intrinsic value. So why shouldn't it be treated in a like above uh, cost and benefit? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, just give me a second. Uh, Okay, so I'll just go to two and we'll come back. Okay, two, did you have something? All right, Kanich, did you have something? Oh, here we go. Uh, yes, I just sent it. Okay. Yeah, you can okay. Um, so, can I elaborate a little bit? Who's um, who was that? <laughs> it's me, Kanish Fatima. Uh, let me see. I'll go with Kanish right now, and then I'll get back to those other people. Truly, um. Okay. <clears throat> Just mainly three points, Ganesh. What did you get that you wanted to mention? Uh, yeah, one, one thing is to say that human life and the natural world are the, are the, they are connecting with each other and, and nature is the God. Like uh, in the religious belief, they say that's different every type, uh, God is different in every religious, but in here so that natural is the God, but uh, people's uh, belief is in a different way. And another thing you say that, yeah, the uh, human, all human uh, should have the one responsibility that they live in the universe. So they have the responsibility to take care of it. That's the two things I got. Okay, good. Um, all right. So who was, who was it that, um, who's next? Let me, let me go with people I haven't called on yet and then I'll go back. And I think Sristi and Neetu want to do a second round. So just sec. Raihana, do you have something? Did you find something? Okay, Rossi, did you find something? Yes, Dr. Bike, I did. Um, it's about Buddhism, and I'll share the link here. It is um, the Mahayana Buddhism and Environmental Ethics from the Perspective of the Consciousness Only Doctrine by Yamamoto. Um, Here's the link to that okay. Okay. article. And three main points that I get from here is that the consciousness only doctrine, it sheds a light on how human behaviors affect the environment. And there are two types of, um, there are two types of scientific and inventions for humans. One is the one is the one with the intention to harm or kill animals like chemicals and fertilizers. The other one doesn't have the intention to kill, but result in killing and destroying the environment. And for the first one with the intention to kill, it's known as karma seed. And here, it's really hard for um, Buddhists to get away from the sin, like the sinful results of that because 
since we have the intention to kill and destroy others, we have to pay back for what we have done. However, for the second type of invention with the with no intention to harm, but result in harming, we can still do good deeds to kind of like elevate like the sinfulness of it. And for me personally, I think that humans have the brain to process and to research in depth what their products have done before releasing it into the market. So there shouldn't be an excuse that their products doesn't have the intention to harm because we have the resources to create those products. So we should also have the resources to study those products before put before introducing it to others too. Okay, good. All right. And then Fahima, do you have something? <clears throat> She probably is disconnected. Okay, Sristi, and then I'll go to Nitu. Okay, Sristi, there we go. She's got her paragraphs. Um, very good. <clears throat> Did you want to say what's in those paragraphs? Okay, very um, yes, good. Uh, because it's actually very long, so I, got, I kind of lost at some point while searching for it again. Uh, yeah, so it was like um, they talk about different religious groups in Australia and how their views are different on climate change and uh, climate change, especially, yes. And here, like for the Christians, like uh, they are, sorry, I. Uh, yeah the, so the the christians were like they were supportive of sorry professor i i just i just lost well it. actually i mean what i'm noticing here is that the the baptists and the mormons believe in may may human dominance and the episcopalians yeah. and the methodists and also yeah, yeah. There's a difference in like the beliefs in Buddhism groups, and they're like the monks. Uh, they are like some work conflict between the monks and the people, the Buddhist monks. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep, that's kind of where we're at around the world, right? Yeah. Uh, also, yeah, Professor. Like there was a thing like. Um, uh, there was a thing about monks like white and argued instead that uh, the Buddhist goal of detachment includes a detachment from the natural environment and the injunction in cult, classical Buddhist texts for monks not to dig in the ground to due to the possibility of injuring a worm is driving yeah. more like uh, Harris uh, and people named Harris argue that by concern to avoid spiritual pollution for the monk than it is by any inherent value for the natural environment. Okay, and the Christian good. beliefs are like the opposite. Right, well, he does say that the, the Episcopals and the Methodists, the people who unite reason and faith, Presbyterian, Methodist, Episcopal, Unitarian, um, they are advocating a stewardship view, which was Debal, what we read. But the Baptists, it's just like what's going on in America. Um, and the Mormons are advocating, you know, uh, human dominance and control. And it's anti-science, the Baptists and the Mormons split religion and science. And it's pretty awful that this is you know, on that completely on the other side of the world. So I, I do want to impress on you the power of culture, right? And culture is the way people talk to themselves and each other. And it, it can become this feedback loop that has nothing to do with, you know, facts, right? And so that's the power of religion is no matter how bad it gets, you know, 
like the fires in California and the floods, like they don't care. They have a set of beliefs that says, well, if it's the end of the world, that's it. But I still get to drive my gas guzzling truck. And so that's why I went into philosophy because science, you know, doesn't move people. Ideas drive behavior. And that makes people incredibly dangerous and incredibly virtuous. But in the environmental stuff, it's dangerous. So that's why some people say get rid of all religion <laughs> because, you know, religion can uh, like, flip. Yeah, they literally like try to increase the dominance to um, increase the, sorry, to inflect affect the affect the behavior of the people and yeah so so each of you can sort of clock in on that my main point is for you to understand the debate and that it's complicated and there really are sides there you could really argue that we need religion moving forward because of the virtues of um the the evils of pride and arrogance or that people in the name of religion will literally let the earth die, right? And they will be convinced they're gonna go to heaven. Um, so it really is incredible how differently those positions end up. Um, so that that's kind of my wrap up on that right now. Oh, Professor. Me? Yeah, yeah. I would like to add something. If you, yeah, Nietzsche okay. wanted yeah. to add to, but go ahead, Mosa. Sorry, thank you so much. So, Professor, I have found something else. So, one article. So, we, as we are talking about religion and the relationship between religion and the, you know, environment. So, what I have found that. So, and okay, and this is a study which is uh, taking place in Colombia. And uh, like it's uh, like International Art Science Inter Information Network and the Columbia Aging Center, they have doing an analyzing study. And what they have found that professor like, and they looked at the environmental religion relationship uh, by analyzing religion, religion affiliation together. So with a variety of environment and climate change related uh, indicator and the country level. So what they have found that professor like, uh, they have found uh, who the people who are less religious, they tend to use more resources uh, from the environment and they produce more emotion, em, uh, emissions. And then um, at the same time, they are also better prepared to deal with resulting environmental challenges because they're all there, they're making so much money from that. But on the other hand, nations who like for example, who are more religious, they tend to use fewer resources. And at the same time, they have less capacity to meet environmental challenges because they are, you know, uh, they're subject to uh, more adverse outcome because and, and due, to, due to their high levels of poverty and who is, you know, leads to the continuing population growth. So uh, what I understood, and can you uh, and I found this article very interesting, Professor, because I have uh, you know uh, go through a lot of articles and mostly say that okay. And as previous speakers said, like you know, uh, Catholic and then Christian Catholic are more interested to um, play an important role in order to save you know um, environmental challenges and the Christian. So they, uh, you know. They, they themselves say that they are uh, religious, but they are not, you know, ready to, <laughs> you know, solve the problem and face the challenges and financially uh, donate it in order to, you know, uh, right. solve the environmental challenges. But the thing is that, Professor, so my, I was like, I had a lot of questions in my mind, okay, how could you do that? So, so because I'm following certain religions like Islam. So there is nothing to do with Islam and religion. So I have going through a lot of um, examples yeah. and articles and found that and like, okay, 
uh, and these are the um, you know mm, research article and I, I I and and very tough to do so I got I I go through that and I feel that okay and religious has a very important role in order to save environmental right. challenges. Well, there's also the class problem, right? The people in the upper class might be yes. secular, right? And the people in the lower classes might be more humble, but they don't have control. So Karl Marx, again, you can go back to Karl Marx and say, it's all about class, right? And class struggle. Um, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's very good. Most of those are good points to bring up. What about you, Nitu? I think you're the. I think you were going to do a second, second round. Uh, yeah, Professor. Go ahead. Uh, yes, Professor. Uh, so the article I have found. Uh, yes, Professor. Uh, uh, professor, I have downloaded a PDF, so right now I can't find the link. So I'll just discuss uh, what I have understood from that article. Okay. Uh, so that article uh, is about multiculture and uh, environmental ethics. So there, uh, Donald Brown uh, has said that as a uh, most of the religion uh, find nature as a sacred object. So it adds an intrinsic value uh, to their morals and ethics. So it, it should not be uh, treated in a like cost benefit analysis. Moreover, like if the approach is religious, uh, then you know people find intrinsic motivation to do more about uh, things which will help environment as they find uh, Nature as a source of guidance, teaching, and you know, power. So that's the thing I have understood. Okay, from that good. Well, the other thing the rest of you could notice, right? This is called BBC Earth. You could go to BBC Earth and find articles that aren't so long if you want to do that. Um, all right. So, whoops, what's that? Oh, screen sharing. All right. Um, okay, so there's another um, link that, all right. So I'm saving all these links and then I think I'll attach them to a stream, right? Okay, so right now I want to um, move on and sort of, uh, we have, oh, let's take a five, let's take another seven minute break, all right? Another seven minutes. And I will sort of try to weave together everything we've done and then sort of show you where we're going next. And um, that'll be it. So take five. Well, I have 19 after the hour right now. So we can go to 25 after the hour. And then we'll have um, 45 minutes left. Uh, OK, so take a break.
Mm. So I want one more round of you going through um, this series of questions. Um, what do you think? Do you think CDE? What do you think about that? When he started talking like that, that um, are those distinctions important? Are they helpful? Do you think they're harmful? Do you think they're true? Or I think, um, let's see, Sauda, you know, the question for, okay, Sauda, I'll start with you. Yeah, what do you say if religion has no authority for, if for you, right? What are you going to think about something like that? Go ahead, Sauda. Uh, yes, Professor. So is it the question B that you're saying? Well, I'm saying, you know, he says that oh, I see. Okay. humanistic philosophies aren't good enough. Um, human reasoning is not good enough. Socialization is not good enough you know, all these other explanations, but Islam, you know, and the messengers were special and they were inspired by God. And so this is the best foundation. What do you think of that, Sauda? Well, I mean, it's the best foundation only if you like have faith and believe in it. If uh, someone who doesn't, care about it who doesn't even know or believes anything or more someone who isn't motivated by islam or like faith or religion at all it's not the best way for them they need other motivation other reasons to drive them so i mean it could be the best motivation for muslims and people muslims who are devoted but other than that crowd, everyone else, no. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, good. So what about the rest of you in terms of if you want to move culture into a green paradigm, what do you think the foundation of it should be, right? So out of the things we've read so far, Sauda, which one seems most compelling to you? Uh, I mean, probably uh, utilitarianism. So, okay. uh, so maximizing happiness and everything if we can convince people, because that's what motivates everyone whether you're a believer or not, everyone wants to be happy and happiness motivates everyone. So if you can convince people that if uh, that in getting a green sustainable uh, in, uh, economy would maximize your happiness, it will be beneficial for everyone, then I think no matter what you believe in or what motivate uh, reason mean you need, that's like an universal thing that could unite everyone. Okay, good. Do you think children should get habituated into that from when they're young? Probably not because if that's your only motivation, then well, the question of ethics and morals comes in because we can justify anything okay. with that. Because like it makes me happy, so I will do it. Like if especially if children think that's their like right thing to do. If anything, if anything makes me happy, then that's right. If that's the logic, then it's not really good for them because they can, you know, if uh, 
like okay so i was reading like the cons uh the whole animal rights thing and if children uh finds like i see like uh, i mean even in different literature or movies or whatever even in uh people like there's there's this trope of like children uh play torturing animals like tort playing with ants or frogs there's like uh even stories about that like fairy tales and stuff that tell children are torturing animals and there's this moral le lesson that we should they shouldn't so but like in those situation it makes them happy to play with a life or whatever it's like a insignificant thing to them so if they don't any if the logic is it makes them happy and so they're going to keep doing it they they're not learning the moral lesson like they're not valuing life so if and that's really problematic right learn. okay so then the question is how do you raise them right what do you tell them should be their motive for stuff um okay very good soda what about somebody else who wants um Hoppy, do you have a reaction? How about two? Do you have a reaction? Um, Rossi? I'll skip this one, Dr. Beck. I don't okay. know what to okay. say. Did you, do you remember reading this, where he said this? It's a while back, so like that's why, like, okay. Okay. since I read it, so yeah. Okay. What about need to? Um, professor, initially it comes like uh, humanistic philosophies, like can be better than uh, religious ethics and all, but. Uh, Sometimes I feel like if uh, uh, humanistic philosophies can be like uh, better for the people uh, and comes, uh, you know, uh, poor background uh, for Hello, Professor Ben. Okay. Am I, am I audible? Yep. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay, Professor. Actually, I'm having some internet issues, so. Are you there? No. Okay. I'm going to go to, let's see. Is nobody, Connage? Uh, yes, ma'am. Do you have a reaction? Did you, what did you think when you read this? Uh, miss, uh, honestly, I haven't read this one yet. Okay. Um, all right. So I would, yeah. Okay. And then, look, the reason I have this outline, right, is for you to keep weaving the stuff together. Right? How do we take everything we've studied so far and look at the article for today in light of these things? Um, let's see. So, so for next time, um, we are going to do, there's a short article on Buddhism and the environment and a short article on Hindu. Um, and it, if you didn't bring an article today, it would be nice if you did next time. Um, but my main, you know, emphasis is after today, right? After right now, as soon as you can do your post. So you don't have to spend time reviewing, right? So right, okay. So I'm gonna let you go 10 minutes early but I want you to write, right? Right away, right when it's fresh in your mind, 
because even if you have a class right after this, you have 10 minutes, you probably have 20 minutes or something because I, I really have, you know, realize you're gonna have to do so much work unnecessarily because you have to do it twice. So um, that's it. I'll let you go early just so that you'll do that for me. <laughs> Does everybody understand <laughs> then why, you know, why I'm saying this, like do it right away, right now, so that you don't waste time, um, spend too much time on my class. Ma'am. Yeah? Uh, the note it takes and the class discussion you're taking us to post, is that post seven or six? Because you told us to do it again, number six, like you changed it something. I think number six was the summary of the class. So I think I renumbered them. Um, okay. Is it uh, today is the discussion and the common ability is post six? Well, post seven, whatever one says Islam. Yeah. So if number six is about Islam and any uh, other things, uh, class comment. So we will do the, that in seven, but if six, seven, also in six. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go, um, you know, edit that if it's confusing. Um, I might have gotten that wrong because I did change it. So, okay, I'll go to do that right away. Um, anything else? Any other questions? Actually, one more announcement. I sent you the link to the conference next, um, what would it be, Wednesday morning for you? I'm presenting a paper at that conference. It's exactly the same time as the class, but I do think um, you would learn a lot from listening to these scholars and they really are trying to develop an international culture. And then, um, I'm going to bring up environment uh, just partly because my class will be there, but also it's important to bring it up and it wasn't explicitly stated in the conference materials, but it's a, uh, somebody I know. I've been in conferences in Indonesia before and so the guy who organizes in Indonesia. So. Okay, let me, I'm gonna let you go because I do want you to just sit there and write for at least 10 minutes and get that post done, okay? Okay, Professor, thank you, bye. Bye-bye.